HIV is a, uh, the first, in fact, the first human retrovirus. So that's a particular class of viruses uh, that are known to exist in other species, and HIV is the first example of one of those species, one of those viruses in humans. So it was first identified in uh, the early 80s when there was a series of cases of gay men uh, turning up in hospital in emergency rooms with a new illness that appeared to be related somehow to immunodeficiency. So their immune systems were failing and it really wasn't clear why that was. And it took some time to work out that this was a new viral infection that hadn't been seen in humans before. So it was first described in the early 80s in San Francisco and then it was realized that it was more widespread than that. Uh, the people who identified it worked at the Institute Pasteur. So Francoise Barsanoussi, Luc Montagnier uh, had a lab uh, working on uh, other retroviruses and they discovered that uh, they looked down a microscope essentially, an electron microscope, and they could see that uh, there was a, uh, a retrovirus in the cells from the patients who had this disease. Uh, they won the Nobel Prize for that work. A lot of other people contributed in the US, for example, Robert Gallo. And that was uh, that retrovirus then, the test was developed and uh, we could test uh, who had the virus. Uh, it turned out that quite a large number of people had that virus and at that early point there was no treatment. So uh, it turned out that it's spread through sexual transmission, it's a sexually transmitted disease, it can also be spread through blood products. So in the early days before screening, uh, people who were taking blood products as a medicine, for example with pe people with haemophilia, uh, were infected with the virus. You could be infected uh, through blood contact uh, for example. So uh, intravenous drug users uh, also were very susceptible to catching it because there's a tendency to share needles and so if one person was infected that would infect everybody who shared the needle. So in those early days it was very frightening because it was a new virus and people were dying and nobody really knew uh, what to do about that. But luckily we knew quite a lot about retroviruses because retroviruses had been described in other species, particularly mice. So uh, it was reasonably quickly for uh, the development of a new type of medicine to come up with ways to treat HIV. And that uh, treatment advanced to nowadays, in 2016, you can really uh, treat the virus with a cocktail of antiviral drugs that will stop it um, infecting new cells in your body, theoretically. And that means that the virus becomes undetectable in the vast majority of cases, and we think that you can probably live a normal lifespan if you take your antiretrovirals. That's fine if you can afford the antiretrovirals. So in the West, that is great. Uh, in uh, resource-poor settings like Sub-Saharan Africa, that's more problematic, where there is less, uh, less money available to buy antiretrovirals, which can be quite expensive. Uh, but they are available, and there are large programs uh, to roll out antiretroviral treatment with the goal of making sure that everybody who has the disease has access to antiretrovirals. So HIV is the human retrovirus. It stands for human immunodeficiency virus. The most common, uh, there's several versions of it, and the most common one is called HIV-1. So uh, AIDS is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, and that is the disease that's caused by uh, being infected with HIV. And as far as we can tell, we believe that pretty much everybody who becomes infected with the virus will eventually get disease. So it's extremely rare for somebody to uh, never get disease. And it's very difficult to say whether somebody would never get it. They might die for some other reason. Or, uh, but, but the vast majority of people uh, suffer from disease, but not until about uh, eight to 10 years after they've become infected. So there's a long period where they don't really suffer significant symptoms, although there are symptoms. When you first become infected with HIV, you get infection uh, syndrome very similar to other viral infections, so for example influenza. So you, uh, the virus replicates in your body to very large, uh, very high titers, very large amounts of virus in your body, and it makes you feel quite ill, and you might have a rash and a temperature, and you might spend a few days in bed, and you feel like you've had some kind of viral infection. And then it goes away, and your immune system suppresses viral replication, and it can suppress it to very low levels so that you can't actually detect the virus in your body after that first couple of weeks of infection. So what happens after that has been, you know, it's not entirely clear, but what's certainly true is that your immune system is fighting an ongoing battle with the virus. 
and you don't feel uh, particular symptoms during that period. So there's a sense that you've got better, you've recovered from the virus, but that isn't the case in the case of HIV. It's still in your body uh, replicating. And that means that eventually, uh, for reasons that we don't fully understand, your immune system runs out of energy or runs out of steam and it starts to fail and the virus gets the upper hand and destroys your immune system. This, this long battle with the immune system uh, between the virus and the immune system leads to a complete failure of your immune system for reasons we don't fully understand. And that's why you get disease. And the disease of HIV is largely a disease of opportunistic infection. So the disease, the, the um, uh, illnesses that you would not normally suffer, so for example fungal infections, we're constantly exposed to fungi that would like to eat us up, but they don't because our immune system protects us from it. But without an immune system, those fungal infections start to cause very bad infections in your mouth and in your lungs, in your airways. And uh, when AIDS was first described, those kind of diseases had not been seen in humans before because we were very good at fighting them off using our immune system. So it was very difficult to treat them. Nowadays, that's much more uh, treatments have been developed for those diseases. But there's a, there's a long period where your body between eight to ten years of the median period where your body is fighting the virus and uh, keeping it in check. So if you get infected with HIV, I think the, the modern uh, thinking is that you should be treated with drugs as soon as possible. So in the past we've thought, seeing as you're not suffering overt symptoms, there's no need to take the drugs until you start to suffer the symptoms and uh, we can measure the amount of uh, CD4 cells, the target of the virus, and we can monitor how your immune system is doing. So in the past, we've kind of only started treating people when they reach a certain point where their immune system is, is uh, breaking down. Nowadays, I think we're thinking that treating early is probably better because it protects your immune system from the damage that you're going to, it's going to take, even though you don't uh, suffer particularly severe symptoms. So the goal of the therapy that you take now is simply to stop the virus replicating. But that doesn't uh, constitute a cure, unfortunately, and we don't really understand why that is. So if you take the drugs, you can suppress the virus replication until you can't see it. It can be completely undetectable in your body. And yet, if you stop taking the medicine, within a short period of time, a few months perhaps, sometimes years, the virus will come back. So we know the drugs don't get rid of it, and we know your immune system can't get rid of it, but we don't really understand why. There's really two possibilities for that, I think, and uh, it's uh, currently a very... Uh, a lot of research trying to work out which of these two possibilities is true, possibly both. Possibility number one is that the virus is in your body somewhere, in the organs, perhaps in the gut, in the lymphoid tissue, and is replicating there just at low levels. Another possibility is that it really does stop replicating and the drugs get rid of all of the cells that are making virus and the only cells that are left in your body are virus that, cells that have got virus in them but that aren't actively making virus. And so you can't get rid of those guys until they start making virus. So if you stop taking the medicine, sooner or later those cells will start making virus and the whole process will start again. So we don't really understand whether we need to uh, make the drugs better to kill the virus, the last little bit of virus, or whether we need a new strategy to wake up the cells that are quiet and not making virus so that we can kill them as well. And that's the, that essentially constitutes the uh, cure research agenda that is currently trying to work out the best way to actually cure people. So I think there are two broad uh, areas of HIV research. So uh, particularly in the US I think now, there's a very strong effort to focus everybody's research onto cure. There's a sense that we shouldn't be uh, fooling around, we should just focus on curing the patients that are infected and that that is really the only way to eradicate the disease. There's also of course a big effort to make a vaccine but we just don't understand how to make a vaccine and we just don't understand enough about vaccines as to understand why we can't make an HIV vaccine. The, the things that have been tried are the classical ways to make vaccine and they simply don't work for HIV. There's lots of possible reasons for that but we don't really understand why and so I don't think anyone really believes that there's going to be a vaccine anytime soon hence I think the shift towards the notion that perhaps we can start to think of new ways to cure people perhaps with new strategies, new therapeutic strategies. So that's one big area focused on uh, research. So the second 
broad area of HIV research, I think, is using HIV as a tool. So uh, HIV is a fairly small virus. It only has nine genes, so it makes nine proteins. Some of those proteins are quite complex and they're broken up into other proteins, but it's a simple virus. A herpes virus, for example, would have more than 200 genes, whereas HIV only has nine. So that makes it a very tractable genetic tool. So we can uh, use the virus to study cell biology and that's uh, a very, uh, been a very powerful way to understand what's going on inside the cells of our body. How do they work? How do they divide? How does stuff move around? How are they organized? And, and HIV is a fantastic tool for doing that. So for example, we've learned a great deal about RNA export from the nucleus. How does RNA uh, export from the nucleus regulated? How is splicing regulated? HIV has to manipulate those processes and uh, studying how it does that has taught us a great deal about that. We've understood a great deal about transcriptional control. The virus carries its own transcriptional activator, a protein called TAT, and how that works is quite different from other transcriptional activators, and studying it has learnt, taught us a great deal about how transcription works. So there's, there's, uh, it's a fantastic uh, tool to use for various uh, scientific questions. So we, uh, in my own laboratory, use HIV really as a tool to study innate immunity. A question is, that we are asked, is uh, does studying HIV and how it works help you uh, cure it as a disease or cure other diseases? And the answer is yes, I think. So it's very important to understand that when HIV uh, first showed up in the early 80s, the only way that we could uh, developed treatments was because we understood retrovirus biology from understanding mouse retroviruses. So all of the treatments for HIV are based on a sound understanding of how it works. And as we increase our understanding, uh, I think that helps us develop more treatments. It's a question uh, as to whether we need more treatments. The treatments we have in the clinic at the moment are pretty effective. Uh, drug resistance is something of a problem. So if you treat uh, a person with a single drug, then the virus can mutate and change and not be sensitive to that drug anymore. That's much less of a problem if you treat with several drugs, so typically people treat with three drugs. Nonetheless, drug resistance is arising, uh, it is becoming more prevalent, and it is possible that we'll end up in a situation similar with antimicrobial resistance, that the drugs we have in the clinic are less effective against viruses like HIV. So studying viral infection in general also is very important because there is a possibility that as we understand more about how viruses replicate and particularly about how cells typically protect themselves from infection and how viruses get over those protective strategies, we can start to understand that there are certain things that many different viruses have to do in order to infect human cells. And if we start to drug those processes, there's every chance that you could start to develop antivirals with much broader specificity. So you might be able to develop drugs that hit multiple viruses with a single drug. And I think that's something that's only really now becoming a realistic prospect, but it's something that we feel uh, very, uh, very enthusiastic about.